Services, welcoming you to our webinar this week. Today we are going to be talking about the role of functional and regenerative medicine in plantar fasciitis, plantar fasciosis. So we have exercises where we make it easy for you to create, track, and manage exercise programs for your patients and clients. We like to have these webinars because if we can bring a community of better educated clinicians, we're going to get better outcomes and happier patients and clients. So our bi-monthly, uh, bi-weekly webinars are exactly that education base, bringing thought leaders of the industry and experts to really give you great information, something tangible that you can walk away with when you see your patient and client later, later day in this afternoon. Well, today we have a great speaker lined up on the topic of plantar fasciitis, plantar fasciosis. And, you know, it's a really, as, as a clinician, I didn't realize until recently how prevalent this is. And I know Dr. Emily can speak more about this, but one out of 10 people suffer from this. So this is a huge number of patients and clients that have this condition that hopefully you're going to gain more insight and really provide good treatment options from a conservative or maybe a referral um, and understanding, you know, what are the treatment options are, are out there um, with such a prevalence. Um, uh, so just think of that. One out of every 10 or so of your patients and clients uh, have had or have had experienced um, this type of condition. So, again, trying to make better education clinicians and better outcomes for all of our patients and clients. We all win that way. And so, as usual, there's going to be an opportunity to type in some questions, which I'll moderate when Dr. Emily is done with the presentation. So, on the GoToWebinar widget screen, just go and type in your questions, and we'll moderate. I'll moderate those. And also, stay in tune. She has a great new product out, which she's also going to be discussing, um, and there'll be a great discount on that as well. So, stay tuned for the end of the, the webinar. And so today's speaker is uh, just a, a fantastic person. Uh, I've known her for several years now. Just There's no one that works harder in the industry and is just so passionate. That's why I love her so much because she's just so damn passionate about what she does. She's a member of the American College Foot and Ankle Orthopedics and Medicine Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine. Uh, she also is a member of Gait and Clinical Movement Society. She's a podiatrist out of New York. And she's been on the Today Show, Oprah Winfrey Show, uh, The Doctors, Good Day New York, uh, The Dr. Steve Show. So she's really out there discussing what she does out to the public because she's so passionate about it. She's also the founder and CEO of Evidemate Fitness Academy, is one of the foremost experts on barefoot training as well. She's a corrective exercise specialist. She's certified personal trainer through the NSCA, uh, also group fitness instructor. So she's just got a vast vast knowledge base in what she does. She travels extensively and she's going to Europe next uh, month to continue her ed, uh, to continue uh, lecturing on a lot of the topics, um, part of the Evidence Fitness Academy. So I want to welcome my good friend, Dr. Emily Spiegel. So happy to have you back and talking about just such a relevant topic. I'll let you uh, take it away, Dr. Emily. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to do a webinar again with Web Exercise. Thank you for the introduction, Dave. That was very nice of you. Um, thank you to everybody who is tuning in, especially those who are tuning in live, taking some time away from uh, helping your patients and clients to better yourself and uh, get a little bit deeper understanding on uh, functional medicine, regenerative medicine, and how we can apply it in plantar fasciitis, plantar fasciosis, uh, chronic heel pain, uh, and related conditions. Uh, so as David had mentioned, he gave a, a fabulous introduction that I don't really feel like I need to reintroduce those things, um, but I will add on um, to what he had said as even though I am podiatrist trained uh, here in the U.S. at NYCPM and then went on to get my master's, is I try to take a very functional, integrated approach with my patients. Um, try to always have some sort of um, leading answer or um, treatment protocol for my patients so that they know kind of the latest options that exist, whether it is an integrated physical therapy approach 
or it happens to be the regenerative medicine and the stem cells that we're going to talk about at the end of this webinar. So very much try to uh, find that integrated functional regenerative medicine approach with all of my patients and helping them understand how their body truly functions um, so that they take ownership of their injury as well, which I think is uh, hugely important. So um, as David had mentioned in the beginning of this, it is very important to be thinking about treatment options that are really for what is the 10% of classic heel pain plantar fasciitis patients that are not responding to conservative treatment. And we probably have all all have had a patient or athlete client, uh, you may have a handful of them right now that you're thinking about and you're thinking about throughout this webinar where they're not responding to your your classic conservative treatment protocol. Whether they're, whether they're doing the icing, the stretching, the rolling, you're doing Greston, you're doing foot strengthening, you're doing you know, myofascial integration, maybe they're doing some gyrotonics and kinesis to get their whole fascial web to uh, open up and better load and unload during dynamic movement, but they are still not responding to those treatments that typically your classic plantar fasciitis patient client athlete is going to respond to. And that, that's what we're going to be focusing on, is we're going to look at some other options, maybe some differentials that you want to think in the back of your mind, and what can we do for that 10% outside of surgery. So I'm not even mentioning surgery here. There are surgical options, but we're going to look at everything outside of that. So plantar fasciitis, fasciosis, um, not going to go too much into that difference between is there really inflammation, is there not inflammation. I will towards um, a little bit towards the end on that, but for right now, for the sake of this, there is a high prevalence of patients presenting with heel pain. Three million doctor visits every year present with heel pain. Heel pain does not mean necessarily plantar fasciitis. There's a lot of differentials. We'll go into a Baxter's nerve impingement that it could be, a plantar fibroma, it could be calcaneal stress fractures, Achilles tendonitis. So there's a lot of differentials that you always want to have in the back of your mind. When you do have a true classic plantar fasciitis diagnosis, 90% of these patients respond to conservative treatment, whether it's physical therapy, steroids, night splints, anti-inflammatories, icing, rolling, stretching, orthotics. 90% of those patients will resolve. And that is especially if they're presenting within, let's say, less than three months. So kind of that classic, you know, they present, they've had plantar fasciitis for six weeks, for two months. My favorite patient to treat because I know I can get them out of pain really quick. Whether I do one steroid injection, follow the rest of my protocol of myofascial release, foot strengthening, modifying impact forces, I know I can get that patient back under control. It's the one that happens to slide past that three months and has chronic, chronic presentation of these symptoms that's going to fall under that 10%. So classic presentation of plantar fasciitis is going to be post-static dyskinesia or pain in the heel after sitting for a certain period. Pain first step in the morning, classic symptom of plantar fasciitis. We know that we're getting a dehydration or a tightening of that tissue when we sit, when we're static overnight. And then the patient goes to step down and we're going to look into the demands of the fascia when we stand and how that puts excessive tension on the fascia. You get micro tearing, you get a pain response. Plantar fasciitis classically is, has an insidious onset. It's progressive, so if the patient does not do anything, it's not going to just go away. I'm sure we've all had that patient that thinks like, oh, it's going to go away, and then all of a sudden they have plantar fasciitis for a year, <laughs> and now they fall under chronic plantar fascial pain which means they now have degeneration and I have to talk about other treatment options with them. Classically have point tenderness at the plantar medial calcaneal tubercle. A little bit more into plantar fascia is this is a dense connective tissue. So I had a master instructor training this weekend and I brought uh, 30 professionals from all over the world into a cadaver lab and they had the opportunity to actually see and feel plantar fascia tissue and they were also able to feel the interosseous membrane between the tibia and the fibula where your deep posterior compartment attaches and they were able to see that similarity of the different types of fascia. 
They were also able to see the gastroc fascia that extends over the soleus belly and then blends into the Achilles tendon. So they were able to see the similarities and differences in superficial fascia versus dense fascia, deep fascia. And the plantar fascia actually surprised a lot of the professionals who attended on how thick it was. It was thick and really it has some resilience to it. And what's interesting is that a study by Kumai and Benjamin saw or found that there were actual chondrocytes, histologically chondrocytes in the plantar fascial tissue. This means that it gave that dense, uh, dense connective tissue almost like a fibrocartilage characteristic. And that, that makes sense when you see it and you feel it. It's very strong fascia and it doesn't it has give, but not a lot of give. It's not, not like how a muscle belly would stretch. So when you have constant tension on that plantar fascia, you are then going to start to get micro tearing at its insertion if you have some sort of dehydration or degenerative process that's starting. When you have micro tearing, your body repairs those micro tears with a different type of collagen. Those micro tears are repaired with a collagen type 3, which is less elastic than collagen type 1. So then you start to get into this scarring response, and that's where patients get uh, almost like they're stuck in like a hamster wheel, or they get they fall down the, the rabbit hole, or whatever you want to say, um, that they just can't pull themselves out of that chronic state. Oftentimes we see heel spurs that are formed radiographically, However, it's super important for the patient to understand that the heel spur does not mean anything. I still get patients who come in and say, Doc, I've got heel spurs, therefore blah, blah, blah. I'm, and I'm telling them, I don't know who told you in the past that you have heel spurs and therefore you have heel pain. The spur is not causing the pain. What's interesting is that the spurs, when you look at them, oftentimes do not even lie within the plantar fascia itself. It's actually deep to the plantar fascia, so it's closer to the flexor digitorum brevis belly versus deeply integrated and almost like enveloped in the plantar fascia. It's actually a little bit more uh, deep to it that there's some analogy to when you get spurring around a joint, so like osteophyte formation around a joint, there's an analogy of a heel spur actually being more like an osteophyte production versus a spur based on tension. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And then the plantar fascial thickening has a presence of myxoid degeneration, which we often see in the Achilles tendon as well, as well as glycation that is happening. Super, super interesting and important to see this is under ultrasound, we can measure the thickness of the plantar fascia. When you start to see thickening of the plantar fascia, especially in your diabetic patients, clients, athletes, that is telling you or that tells you that they have increased glycation happening. Glycation or the um, oxidation of glucose creating free radicals and AGEs or advanced glycation end bodies creates non-enzymatic crosslinks in your collagen, which means that it makes your collagen um, haphazard and almost think like scar tissue. So it's creating a degeneration and a dysfunction in the plantar fascia. That happens to be a site and it can actually be used as a screening tool to gauge the glycation state of a diabetic patient. So you see thickening, you can obviously tell them you're clearly not controlling your blood sugar. So what we're going to do is so make sure that we are all on the same page is we're going to make sure that we understand the anatomy. We're going to understand the anatomy from a functional approach. This is not just talking about the plantar fascia as loading and unloading elastic recoil. We want to take it deeper and further into the foot. When I speak about plantar fascia and foot function to my patients, uh, when I do my education under the Evidence-Based Fitness Academy, Fascial tension and fascial integration is key to optimal function of human movement. Your foot and your baseline tension of your foot plays a key role in your overall body tension. Your plantar fascia is a key integrated structure in achieving peak foot tension and stiffness. So we're going to take a look at that. I'm going to go back here real quick. We can see here Achilles tendon here blends into your plantar fascia. What's interesting is that this 
uh, Achilles tendon plantar fascial blend actually decreases with age. So you happen to thin that periosteum and you start to get an actual separation or disconnect be between your Achilles tendon and your plantar fascia. Your plantar fascia then comes down, you have three bands, you have medial, central, and lateral band. Central band is the one that has the greatest amount of tension. When we speak about plantar fascial tears, which I will speak about soon, they are most often seen in the central band. Your plantar fascia continues distally, it splits into five slips, inserting into all five digits. It blends into what's called the plantar plate. So if you're not familiar with the plantar plate, I do highly encourage you to read about the plantar plate. The plantar plate, which inserts into the digits, is key, 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 to keeping your digits in contact with the ground, keeping purchase, stabilizing your MPJs, or the lever of your foot during dynamic movement. And we'll talk about that more. So function number one of your foot is that it resists arch compression. So if we look at this here, your foot is often described as a truss. So there is a tension. You can see the schematic. This is your heel. This is your calcaneus. This is your metatarsals. And then your plantar fascia, which inserts here at the MPJs, keeps the baseline tension pulling center, and then coming from your heel pulling center. So it is keeping a baseline tension to your foot. It's resisting, not, not that your foot, if you do a plantar fasciotomy, your foot's not going to and, and bottom out. That's not what this means. What this means is that it's resisting the compression or the loading mechanism of the foot. Arch compression is a key step in dynamic loading of your foot. So that means that it's going to play an important role in how your body loads elastic energy. So this coming here, this longitudinal tension can also translate to a transverse tension. I'm going to come back to this slide in one second. Here, this is called your tie bar mechanism. So the truss mechanism of the plantar fascia is also referred to as the longitudinal tie bar mechanism of your foot or your plantar fascia. If you can see how it blends into all five digits here, it then becomes what's referred to as the deep transverse metatarsal ligament. So your plantar fascia is going to come distally, longitudinal tension, and then split into a ligament to have transverse tension. There is a direct relationship between the longitudinal tension and transverse tension. That would be your tie bar mechanism, which means your push-off stability when you become a lever, so this is an x-ray of me coming up onto the ball of my foot and becoming a lever, maintains foot stiffness, foot tension, foot stability during the push-off phase of the gait. So that's actually related to your plantar fascia as well. This means that patients who are experiencing plantar fasciitis can also present with a forefoot pathology as well, whether it's metatarsalgia, neuromas, plantar plate tears, etc. So another function of the foot is going to be that it transfers kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy is going to be related to the arch compression. So arch compression is again going to be the dropping mechanism of your plantar fascia. So arch compression, the peak of your arch is your navicular bone. As your arch comes down or that navicular bone comes down, that's going to load your plantar fascia for elastic recoil. That's often referred to as the spring theory or the spring mass paradigm, linked to plantar fascia, also linked to Achilles tendon. What was interesting is that they saw quite a bit, 17% of mechanical work was returned through your plantar fascia. Your Achilles tendon returned 34% of mechanical work. So not directly related to the Achilles tendon, but pretty comparable. So what we saw is that there's a difference in arch compression between walking, running, forefoot striking, rear foot striking. To understand this is going to help you help your patients or your clients, athletes who are runners and have plantar fasciitis. If they're a forefoot striking 
runner with plantar fasciitis, you need to understand that that is the movement of all the movements. That is the movement that loads your plantar fascia the greatest. So then they're going to need to make sure that they have peak plantar fascial elasticity if they're going to do a true forefoot strike. Also helps you understand in your patients with walking that perhaps orthotics and different treatment programs might be appropriate. So I'm going to go into a review study here, and I hope it doesn't confuse anyone, but it has to do with arch compression and the plantar fascia, the role of the plantar fascia. So what this study did is that they took different stiffnesses of orthotics and put them in the shoe. And then they looked at how much the arch compressed, and then they looked at the energy cost of that movement. Okay? So if the orthotic resisted the compression, that means you took away the plantar fascia elastic recoil, and then if your body needs that plantar fascia elastic recoil, your energy cost would go up. Make sense? Right? So if you're not using it the right way, boom, it takes more energy to walk or run or whatever. So they looked at level running, and they used two different types of orthotics. One that resisted the compression of the foot by 50%. We'll say here it says 40, but we'll just say 50 for the sake of this. Then they had another orthotic that was even more rigid, and it blocked the entire compression of the foot. So in one, they got a little bit of their plantar fascia loaded. In the other, they got none of the plantar fascia loaded. What they saw is that both of those orthotics increase your energy return or your energy cost the exact same. So what that means is if you resist just a little bit of compression when you are running, it's the same thing as taking the whole thing away. What that means, what that means is that even just a little bit of resistance of your arch can greatly increase your energy cost. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Then they start looking at walking. Okay, so they had the semi-rigid, they had the super rigid. What they saw is that even with a rigid orthotic, during walking, resisting all arch compression, there was no increase in energy cost. Which means this spring theory of loading your plantar fascia does not apply to walking. So it's going to apply much more to running. When we look at the difference between forefoot and rear foot running, the arch compression difference between forefoot running and rear foot striking is three millimeters, which means the demand on your plantar fascia is greater during forefoot strike running. So with the level running, the majority of your elastic energy return is in the last 25% of arch compression. So even if you are resisting just a little bit of that arch compression, you essentially take away the entire function of the plantar fascia. So when you're thinking of plantar fasciitis and the recommendation of orthotics for your patients or clients with plantar fasciitis, they are runners, you may want to reconsider the role of rigid orthotics for your runners. Can you use the same orthotic for walking and running? I would now, after looking at this different research, say no. I now do not recommend my patients who are runners to use the same orthotic that they use walking as running because we need to let that spring theory or that spring mass paradigm of your plantar fascia to play into or to take place. If you constantly wear orthotics and you block the arch compression during dynamic movement, even if they're not fast running, and then you suddenly take away the orthotic, their foot has been so dependent or so restricted of loading the plantar fascia that now when they finally do, boom, they get plantar fasciitis. I can tell you how many patients, or I can't tell you how many patients because it's so many, take these running classes and have deconditioned elastic recoil of the plantar fascia. They just randomly, oh, there's this new running class at the gym. I'm going to take it. I do it, and boom, I get plantar fasciitis. They're highly deconditioned in the elastic spring mass paradigm of the human foot, and that's what we need to get back in these patients. Moving on. Function number four of your plantar fascia is resupination of your subtalar joint during propulsion. This is also known as the windless mechanism. 
When you bend your big toe back, you tighten your plantar fascia. Because your plantar fascia originates on your calcaneus towards the medial side, when you put tension through your plantar fascia, you are going to invert your subtalar joint, thereby locking your foot. This is going to blend into another function of your plantar fascia, which is referred to as the reverse windless mechanism. The reverse windless mechanism is based on function number one, which is that truss. So your plantar fascia functions in static standing. When you stand statically, you have baseline tension underneath your plantar fascia. It extends into your plantar plate. The function of your plantar plate is to pull your digits down into the ground. That is the primary stabilizing function of your MPJs or your digits is the plantar plate. So you have a baseline plantar fascial tension to keep your foot and your digits plantigrade or purchasing the ground. So for people who stand statically, they are constantly engaging their reverse windless mechanism. This is very destructive to the plantar fascia. It leads to one of the biggest causes of plantar fasciitis is people who stand in one place. Similarly, if you are constantly in a windless mechanism, let's say your client or patient happens to wear high heels all day, you are constantly in a windless mechanism position. You are constantly shortening that plantar fascia in both same ways. So windless, reverse windless, both very destructive to your plantar fascia leading to micro tearing and a decrease in elasticity. Remember if something is kept on constant tension, think of it almost like, I can't remember who, who it was, it was a fascial, maybe it was some of um, Ivor Wolf's research. If you have constant pulling, let's say like wringing out a rag, and you have constant tension or pulling or you're wringing out the rag and it's just kind of you're twisting it and holding and there's tension, 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 tension. You're essentially pulling out all of the hydration of that tissue versus if you're twisting it and moving it and pumping it and rotating it and rotate, 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 right? Now your hydration is kind of dancing within it. So think of, you know, Tai Chi, you know, yoga, gyrotonic, something where you're constantly fluidly moving is shifting and continuously hydrating the tissue versus just wringing out a rag and holding it and then wring out the rag and then pull it as well, you are going to pull out all the hydration of that tissue and then you start to get obviously the pain that we see with plantar fasciitis. So I try to explain that to my patients as well. It may seem super simplistic, but that's good for patients. All right, function number five. Presents excessive force on the metatarsal heads, extremely important. This has to do with your plantar plate and how it keeps your digits pushing down. If you can shift the forces off of the direct metatarsal heads and into your digits, into the phalanges, you then are avoiding excessive pressure which can lead to metatarsalgia, different uh, capsulitis of the MPJs, plantar plate tears, sesamoiditis. There's a lot of forefoot submet issues that patients can get. Neuromas, that's another one, right? So neuromas are caused by a imbalance in the fascial tension of the foot. So we want to be thinking about the function of the plantar fascia beyond just supports the arch or just dynamically loads or just the windless mechanism. It's much, much deeper. Almost everything functionally, fascially coming from the foot all goes back to the plantar fascia. So we want to address it that way. So now we want to start getting into our treatment protocol. So with the treatment protocol, we want to be looking at treating the 10%. Remember I said that 90% of plantar fasciitis, classic plantar fasciitis, respond to conservative treatment. The last 10% that's not responding to whatever it is that your protocol happens to be, those are the ones that we want to address. We always want to have some differentials in the back of the mind. If you are a manual therapist, physical therapist, and they're not responding after, I would say, two months of physical therapy, and they've tried everything, maybe they've even done a couple steroid injections, I would refer them out, get another opinion, get some of these differentials assessed for, because they might be going down a path that it's, it's actually not appropriate. So 
some of those differentials is medial calcaneal nerve entrapment. I always think about possibly there's a nerve that's entrapped. Baxter's nerve or the inferior calcaneal nerve of the lateral plantar nerve which is called Baxter's nerve, can get entrapped as well. I'll show you where those nerves go. Plantar fasciosis means, do we have myxoid degeneration? Is degeneration actually happening in our plantar fascia? And it's not young, healthy. We need to get in and think about regenerative medicine a little bit more. Perhaps they actually have a tear. A tear in itself is not going to respond to that manual therapy. We need to start thinking about the role of regenerative medicine in plantar fasciosis and plantar fascial tears. Possibly they have a plantar fibroma. Do they have plantar fibromatosis, which is much more towards the insertion, or do they have an isolated plantar fibroma, which is going to be much more towards the distal aspect of the fascia? So the classic presentation of the 10%, those that are not responding to your physical therapy or your conservative treatment, maybe your manual therapy, are going to be those that have heel pain for, let's say, greater than three months. If they have heel pain for less than three months and they present in my office, I will suggest to them a steroid. I will tell all of my patients, they come in, they've had it for two months, let's say they've just done um, rolling, stretching, and icing, we'll say. If they haven't done anything for inflammation, if they haven't even done a two-week course of NSAIDs, I will start them in that direction. I will tell them that they need to do something for inflammation. This is where you could start arguing, is it plantar fasciitis, is it plantar fasciosis? And the study that people are often referencing is a study by Lamont. And what they did is they looked at 50 subjects when they were doing heel spur excision surgery and they did a biopsy of the plantar fascia. They took the, the plantar fascia, looked under the microscope, and saw no inflammatory cells. They saw myxoid degeneration, glycation degeneration. So now there's a lot of argument that plantar fasciitis is not even itis, it's osis. Okay. However, you can get what's a perifascial edema. You can get inflammation that's not literally within the fascia, but it is within the pockets of the different layers of the foot muscles between the fascia, and that traps the inflammation. That still causes pain. If you had, and if you think of the anatomy, and I'll show you in a moment, that you had the plantar fascia, and then directly under the plantar fascia, you have your flexor digitorum brevis. Just coming out medially of your plantar fascia is your abductor hallucis. There's fascia that's surrounding those different muscles, and that fascia is blending with the plantar fascia. You can have an inflammatory edema response within those pockets. So even though it's not directly within the fascial fibers and under you know, pathology and histolo histology, many of these patients still do have inflammation. So I do still use it as a key element of my patient treatment. It's their choice if they want to do two weeks of anti-inflammatories or a steroid injection. Patients with plantar fasciitis respond very well to, to steroid injections. When I do steroid injections, I will do typically one or two. I tell them that it's like injecting steroid into a balloon and we're going to decrease the inflammation that's trapped within that fascial pocket in the foot. And then oftentimes, they'll respond. I probably have a 90% success rate with steroid injections in patients who have heel pain for roughly two to three months. And then we proceed to the rest of the other treatment. Now when they present and they've had plantar fasciitis for over six months, then, and maybe they've had steroid injections by another podiatrist, maybe they haven't. The classic presentation of a patient who you know something else is going on is they get a steroid injection, they're, they're fine for like a day, and then bloop, their pain goes right back to exactly where it was. I know that that patient is has something else going on. Something is being missed. That's not the appropriate treatment for whatever their suggested diagnosis is. So on that patient, I will immediately order an MRI. I want to rule out plantar fibroma. I want to rule out a tear. I want to rule out degeneration. I want to rule out nerve entrapment. And then based on those MRI results, I may suggest a nerve block. I may suggest just a steroid. 
I might suggest amniotic injections, or I might, in some cases, some patients, it is appropriate to do a surgical release, which is called an endoscopic plantar fasciotomy. So, of the differentials, this is important to know is if they happen to have a nerve entrapment. There's two nerves that are typically trapped when someone is having non-responding heel pain or non-responding plantar fasciitis, which is actually a nerve entrapment. The medial calcaneal nerve we can see here has many branches, and this branch you could almost envision is going to come down this way. So if, oops, if you were to push on the patient's foot, right here, the medial plantar calcaneal tubercle, they say, I have pain right here, I have pain when I step down, you may just be pushing on a nerve and then they're getting a pain signal, right? So that's often how you could see that confused. That's also where if it is just an entrapped nerve or an inflamed nerve, if you did a steroid injection and there is actually no plantar fascial inflammation but the nerve is inflamed, they will respond. So, there's many variances in nerve branches all over the body, and then especially around the foot. So, always think about that, that everybody has a slightly different nerve distribution, and they may happen to have their nerve distribution is, bam, directly under that plantar calcaneal medial tubercle, and that's why they're presenting this way. Another nerve that is... Uh, often entrapped is the inferior calcaneal nerve, which is also known as Baxter's nerve right here. So it's the first branch off of the lateral plantar nerve. It's right here, and you can see how it's coming underneath the bottom of the foot. So if I were to palpate right here where my arrow is, and they have pain, you could see that that could either be the medial calcaneal nerve, or that could be Baxter's nerve, or the inferior calcaneal nerve. And then the same thing here, you can see how it runs, right? So you always want to think about uh, nerve entrapment. And then the treatment for that would be a nerve block, and if they are, their pain goes away, you obviously know it was nerve-related, or you could do a steroid injection to decrease the nerve around that. In some cases, these patients do need to do a nerve decompression. However, just know that it's not just an open nerve decompression. You now can do hydro dissections of nerves, which means you're doing a minimally invasive uh, decompression of those nerves via the fascial tissue. So just know that that exists as well. In we, if we were to look at the MRI in a normal MRI, so this, the picture on the left is a T1, the one on the right is a T2 MRI scan, you can see this is a normal healthy plantar fascial tissue, this is how it would present on a T1 and a T2 um, MRI, and then I'm going to show you a couple different MRIs of where there is abnormality. So, here, this would be your plantar fibroma. So a plantar fibroma is a response of plantar fascial injury. So there's some sort of injury to the plantar fascial tissue that triggers that scarring response. I often explain it to a patient that is uncontrolled scar tissue growth. And instead of it just being a small scar tissue, it's now, quote unquote, uncontrolled cell growth. They are always benign. They can be treated with steroid injections. There's a procedure called 10X. Um, I have not seen any where they go in and manually kind of grasp in them out. Um, I personally am a little bit hesitant around doing too aggressive manual therapy on a, excuse me, on a plantar fibroma because it's already uncontrolled cell growth. So you wouldn't want to happen to accelerate it because you're triggering those, those abnormal cells not abnormal mean in cancers, but abnormal mean that they're going a little bit more rapidly. Um, there's always excision as well. Um, in residency, I've done a few aggressive fibroma excisions where they had massive voids in their plantar fascia. So in my patients, I try to typically do it more through minimally invasive. And again, there's a procedure called 10X, which you go in with a needle and it uses ultrasound, um, essentially like the same hydrodissection and then it vacuums out the broken up fibroma through that same needle puncture. So really there's no uh, incision at all, it's done subcutaneously. When we look at plantar fascial tears, again as I had mentioned, is that most tears are happening in the central band of the plantar fascia. 
For some reason, I'm getting many patients who present with non-responding plantar fasciitis, whether they've had it for three months or three years, and a majority of those patients have central band tears. And what's interesting is if you can see here on this MRI, think of it almost like layers of your fascia, superficial and deep layers of your fascia. And a lot of those tears that I'm seeing are partial tears of the central band of the superficial fibers. That would be almost like a fraying of your fascia. But that dis disconnect in your fascial integration is going to lead to pain symptoms. Um, think of it like an energy leak in the fascial integration of your foot and in your fascial network of the human body. And it needs to be addressed. Something like that, a partial tear of the plantar fascia is not going to become healthy elastic collagen like the rest of the fascia without something, without some sort of growth factor or procedure or regenerative medicine. So we do want to understand that role and see how we can give these patients options without saying, oh, you partially tore your fascia, therefore you need to go in and just have a full plantar fasciotomy because you did half the job, so let's just finish it and make it a clean cut. Yes, you could say that if your, your mindset was focused on surgery, but we want to understand the role of this regenerative medicine. So, role of regenerative medicine, there are different options. There is PRP or platelet-rich plasma, umbilical cord blood or umbilical cord matrix, amnion membrane, amnion and chorion membrane, and then there's bone marrow aspirate. Even though you may not be doing these injections in your office, you as a physical therapist, manual therapist, someone who's seen these patients, chiropractor, we're all part of the same team and understanding, ah, this is where I can send them to the podiatrist, they will do the injection, and then they go back to me, and I correct their global movement pattern. That's the way that I like to work as a team with allied health professionals. So, you might not be doing it, but knowing when to refer it out is key. So, with the amnion injections, these are the ones that I do, the amnion chorion injection. So, I'm going to show you those here and why why I do much more of the amnion chorion injections versus PRP is patients will come in and they'll still ask for PRP. In my opinion, based on the research and looking at the efficacy of these different injections, PRP is um, a much weaker version of the same thing. I'll tell them that it's almost like old school, not to insult PRP, but <laughs> it's, it's a little like so last year type of regenerative medicine, when there's better things on the market, you want to use something that's much more powerful. And then when you look at bone marrow aspirate, that's an actual surgical procedure. So you have to go in, you have to tap your iliac crest, and you have to get the bone marrow. You're not going to be doing that in the office. No, no. So when it comes to the amniotic injections, understanding where these come from is very important. It will help your patients understand it. It's not something that is... Um, you know, still on trial, it's still, you know, um, voodoo, <laughs> I don't know what you want to say, with it. when people hear stem cells, sometimes they have mixed reactions to it. So, when we look at the placenta, this would obviously be the mother here, and this is the fetus, placenta is here, there's an amniotic membrane and a chorion membrane. This is where you have all of the mesenchymal stem cells, the pluripotent cells, and that's the powerful part of the placenta. When it comes to amniotic injections, the chorion part of the placenta actually has a higher concentration of these stem cells and these growth factors. So there are some injections on the market that are just amnion and not amnion chorion. So just make sure you're doing the right thing. Okay. As far as what these stem cell injections differentiate into, is they can differentiate into keratinocytes, nerve cells, adipose tissue, fibroblasts, chondrocytes. So they can differentiate into all these different connect uh, all the different tissue of the body. There is amazing research showing that you can actually get nerve regeneration after someone had a severed nerve. You can have uh, massive burn victims having these stem cells laid down in sheets and they get beautiful skin that regrows that if you looked under it under a microscope, you'd never be able to tell that they had a burn in that area of their body. 
fascinating. There is amazing research looking at knee osteoarthritis, injections of these amniotic membrane injections, stimulation of the chondrocytes, and how it's helping these patients. With my patients, I use typically Amniofix, which is by my medics. This is a dehydrated amnion chorion membrane injection. They have their own processing uh, application, which is the perion process. So it's, it's their process of getting the stem cells out of the amniochorionic membrane. And the way that you can think of it is that you're essentially injecting these naive, undifferentiated growth factors into the plantar fascia. And then it's, it's like a stem cell magnet that's going to stimulate the fibroblast to regenerate the collagen. It is highly anti-inflammatory, highly anti-fibrolytic, so it's going to break down scar tissue. And then it's regenerative as well. There is no autoimmune response to these injections because it is the part of the placenta that is not in contact with the mother. So this part of the placenta doesn't have an identity to the mother. So there's no auto-rejection to these injections with patients. There is also um, no, uh, yeah, the, the autoimmune, and then they are all scheduled cesareans. Sorry, that's the name that I want, but they are from scheduled cesareans. So there's no, nothing controversial as far as pro-life, pro-choice. Don't even have to worry about that. They're coming from um, full-term births that are scheduled. Uh, with the post-injection protocol, what I do, and then I would pass them back off to you so you can do your global integrated uh, movement programming, is I do two 20 milligram um, amniofix injections with these patients, two weeks apart, they're in a cam walker for a total of four weeks. They must stay in that cam walker for the entire four weeks. They will get a acute inflammatory response from this injection. So I often tell the patient that after the injection, their pain is going to go up to probably like a 10. Like they're going to, like I do the injection that afternoon, the next day they're going to think that they're dying. Not literally, but I tell them <laughs> so that they don't call me freaking out. That this is totally normal. You're going to go to a 10 out of 10. Within 24 hours of that spike in your pain, you're going to drop down to probably a zero and you're going to think that I have this magic touch and you are a bionic person. However, that's not the case. You have to stay in the cam walker for the entire four weeks. Let the body do what it needs to do. Let those fibroblasts regenerate the collagen of your plantar fascial tissue. After those four weeks, we're going to transition into a stiff shoe. If they have to stand for their work, they are going to be in an orthotic. At that same time, they're going to then start doing foot mobility, SMR to the calf, foot strengthening. I transition my patients out of cam walkers very slowly, partly because I'm in New York and everybody walks so much, but I do transition them out very slowly. During that four weeks, they cannot take anti-inflammatories. I do not want them to ice. I do not want them to actively stretch their plantar fascia. They could be in a night splint if they would like. They can do SMR or trigger point release dry needling acupuncture to their soleus, to the rest of the muscles, but they cannot touch the direct plantar fascia. As I mentioned, they will gradually transition to reintroducing stress to the foot. They will do eccentrics, short foot, dynamic movement, jump landings to reintroduce short foot. If they are runners, they cannot run until eight weeks status post first injection. Once I know that they have built the elasticity back into their tissue, knowing that running much more than walking stresses the plantar fascia. Uh, 